good morning. You know, uh, they say that the day after Easter and in the South, the Sunday after deer season starts is the most discouraging day for pastors. But anyway, hey, we got to eat, right? Um, it's good to see everybody. I'm Ken Spicer. If you don't know me, uh, my wife and I are the founders of this church, and uh, we are happy to be part of it, and so proud of, of what the team is doing and has done, and, um, and we're glad to be home, so it's good to see everybody today. What a, what a week we've had. Today is the uh, first Sunday after the election. I know we're all glad that's over, right? And, you know, there for a minute I was afraid I'd miss the rapture because there were 15 million people that were gone from the voting this year. Isn't that crazy? I don't know where those people went. They voted last time, though, and all in the middle of the night, too. It's crazy how, how that many people can vote in such a short period of time. But anyway, uh, it, was, it was nothing short of a miracle, <laughs> for sure. And, you know, I know a lot of Christians are conflicted about, about President-elect Trump, and, uh, and I would just encourage you that throughout the biblical record God has always used imperfect people to do great things. Heck, you're an example of that. And, uh, and he just always has. I mean, Cyrus, Isaiah prophesied Cyrus 150 years before his reign. Cyrus released Israel from Babylonian captivity, and he was a pagan king. Artaxerxes, the Persian king, released Nehemiah to go back and build the walls of Jerusalem. God has always used imperfect people to do great things. And so, you know, because these conversations are being had, which I find a little bit mm, illogical because, you know, we vote policy, not people, right? And policies like um, appointing Supreme Court justices that will do the right thing, which... Trump did, um, things like overturning Roe v. Wade, which is what that led to. Um, you know, there's, there's more than 10 verses in the Old Testament about sacrificing children to Moloch, and not one of them is positive to the people doing the, the act. And I'm a party of an abortion, so there's no condemnation. God's a forgiver of sin. I was a party to an abortion, and my wife refused to have an abortion before I met her, and so we have been fighting for life ever since we met. And so wherever you've been and wherever you come from, don't let the enemy put condemnation and guilt on you because God's a forgiver of people who make mistakes. Amen. But it does, it does position your heart. You know, we, we, uh, we always owned a sonogram machine at our church in California, and we gave free sonograms to anybody that wanted one who was pregnant, whether they went to our church or not and particularly people who were considering abortion. It was just out there. And our people would bring those folks in, and over the course of time, uh, Eve was able to facilitate two private adoptions, and we saved six babies. It was, worth, it was worth the expense of those machines just to help one, you know? And so that's why we vote, you know? We vote for things like that, uh, moving the capital of, of Israel to Jerusalem. You know, the, the, how long has it been since, we've went, since Israel's been a nation and nobody seemed to have that thought until this guy Trump came along, who's not necessarily at that time even considered an evangelical. Some people say he's saved. He certainly seemed to act different after he got shot, didn't he? A little bit of a wake-up call. That was the other thing for me. It's like, which one is the establishment trying to kill? Even if I didn't know anything else about him, that would tell me who to vote for. Amen. And he's not there yet, and he's not the Savior. But again, he is somebody that is committed at least to supporting the things that we believe in this country and what we want to see. Um, and, um, you know, and, and again, listen to me. I feel like this had to happen because if, if the Bible is true, and we know that it is, that's why we're here on, you know, the opening weekend of deer season, uh, <laughs> we know it's true. And if it's going to come to a place where they're saying peace, peace, and then comes sudden destruction, there's got to be peace. 
And the last administration was not going to bring peace. They were going to send your children to war if they could. And so I feel like things are lining up, and I don't believe, you know, not to, not to be a bummer because it's not a, it's not a negative thing, but, you know, we have an opportunity here to get busy with the gospel. And uh, shame on us if we don't make expedient use of that, of that opportunity. Amen? So grab your Bibles. We're going to go to Acts chapter number, chapter number 19. We, uh, we just came back from Kansas, Wichita. I'd never been there before. A lovely, lovely town, actually. I was a little bit unnerved to be there on the election week, so we, we voted before we went um, because you just don't know, you know, things get crazy in a hurry sometimes. That's the other thing, you know. It would be different if it was like last time and it was, a, it was just, you know, so much so much strife, and I give the uh, I give President Biden props for just coming out and and being being gracious and all of that. But it was such a referen- referendum on on silliness in our country. Uh, Trump won every swing state, and I think he lost Illinois by three or four points. I mean, it, it was nothing short of a miracle in our lifetime. And 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 you know, I grew up. Some of you remember. I remember the day that that Nixon left office. In 74, I was a little kid, a really little kid, but I've got a great memory. So I remember that. And then I remember when, when Carter uh, was elected and just some of the things that my dad said, and he was a union guy, but he obviously hadn't drunk the Kool-Aid and there was no internet in those days, right? So you just had your own sort of opinions and made your own decisions and, and people are really manipulated these days, I think, uh, who aren't grounded. Um, and then, and you know, I grew up during the Reagan era, so things were, were pretty good. And, and you know, it's, it's nice to be one of those Teddy Roosevelt kind of guys who, who just is the world's afraid of. Let's just be honest. They were afraid of Reagan, and they're afraid of Trump. And, uh, and that's a good thing to have. Weakness is not a virtue. Being a coward is not a spiritual gift. Uh, being a jerk also isn't, you know. So we do, we are, we are gracious people, and we love everybody. Uh, but we do know what we believe, and we stand for that. So let's go to Acts 19. Let's look at some of this today. Um, this really has nothing to do with the election, but I think it hopefully was going to encourage you. Acts 19, and I'm going to jump in here in verse number 11. Maybe you've heard this story. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from the body of the sick, And the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? When the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear uh, fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together, And burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Now watch this. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I'm of the opinion, and I'm calling this message today the American Church of Sceva. Because just like these children of the Jewish priests who called on the name of Jesus whom Paul preached, you got a lot of people in America today calling on the Jesus that Paul preached without any revelation or understanding of the power of God. We've been completely divorced of his abilities in the earth, and we've traded that for a nice hermeneutical, homiletical, three points in a poem, preaching to you know Christianette so they could run outside and have a cigarette, and we've got what we've got in the world, and the word of God has not prevailed mightily even though the church of Sceva is full on Sunday. 
you understand, we have decided that there's no more miracles. We have pontificated that there's no more power. Somehow we've deduced because we prayed for Grandma May and she died that healing's not for today. When we had no faith, we were standing on nothing but hope and emotion. We had no foundation in the truth of God's word that is ever true and never changing. I believe that part of the problem we've had in America and we continue to have is because the church has not been the church in quite a long time in most places. Just one more political arm of whichever faction people happen to believe in. Mm, mm, mm. This type of unbelief in the power of God, the miracle power of God, the, the anointing of God that enables people to break free from the yoke of bondage and whatever that might be, that type of unbelief is what has turned the gospel essentially into just mental assent. It's just we think we're going to win the 1040 window with a superior argument, apparently. We're going to send our theologians and they're going to sip their whiskey and smoke their cigars and they're going to debate people over how good God really is, how much more he's better than everything else going on in the world, and it's just empty. Because never in the history of the scripture and never in anything you've ever read does Paul go in with a superior argument, even though he had one. He said in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, he said, I come to you not with persuasive words of men's wisdom, but I come to you in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. This guy had more degrees than a thermometer. He could have said, I'm coming to you highly educated, locked and loaded with the best, you know, speech that you can imagine. And you are going to get saved and give your life to Jesus and have hope for your future and that of your children just because my words are so eloquent. He, he could have been one of the ones that could probably had said that in some level of confidence. But that's not what he said. He recognized that the only way to change the spirit world was to change the physical world with the power of God. And now the, the message has a foundation. The, 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 the argument has a foundation. And we see that the, the entire community was in awe at that. And that's, that's what we haven't had in America in a really long time because somewhere down the line we decided that the power of God had passed away. Now, talking about the power of God, I should mention that today is the Marine Corps birthday. And, and that has made the nation possible. No offense to anybody else, but... The Marine Corps was born in 1775, and as you know from American history, the nation was born in 1776. So, if you're a United States Marine in this room, would you just stand up and let us all say happy birthday to you very quickly. There's, some, there's another one hiding back there. So anyway, and then tomorrow is Veterans Day. So are there any veterans of any other branch? Would you stand up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. In all, in all fairness to the Army, I went to uh, jump school with the Army, and, and it, was, uh, it was outstanding. And, and just full disclosure, I tried to talk my son into joining the Army uh, after being in the Marines for six years. And, of course, he didn't listen to me and I think regretted that from day one. But anyway, hey, we're all Marines, and we don't, we don't complain, right? We lived in bushes in Somalia for a couple of months, and, and they brought this guy from India out, this, this general, and, and he came out with this big entourage, and we were supposed to turn our position over to his guys so we could go back to Mogadishu and do some other stuff. And uh, he gets out there, and he looks around, and he goes, my men can't live like this. <laughs> you got to build us something, and then we'll come back. So he gets in his Humvee and leaves, and we're all high-fiving each other because, you know, we're so hardcore that even, you know, People from India can't live like this. And then by the time his Humvee and entourage went over the horizon, we realized we're still living in bushes. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> anyway, um, 
So let's talk about this for a minute because I know kind of what, what we've been taught over, over the, the decades is that the miracle stopped. You know, the, the disciples did what Jesus did, but it really stopped with them or at best even you throw maybe Paul in there. And so it was just for the disciples and Paul because they needed the power of miracles and so forth to get the new covenant started. But, but the thought is, is I guess we, we didn't need anything beyond that. So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's look at that idea for a minute. It says in Acts 6 verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power. So if you know the story of Stephen, he was one of seven waiters. So I don't know about you, but I started my career uh, my working career as a waiter. And, uh, and so he was chosen by the disciples, the apostles, uh, to, to wait tables with six other guys so that they could study and prepare to minister and that kind of thing. And so they were taking care of the administration of the things in the church there in Jerusalem. So Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So here's a waiter, not Paul, and not one of the twelve doing great signs and wonders among the people. Now remember, this got him killed in the first century. It's likely to get some of us killed in the 21st. People like their dead dogma, and they're not going to like people like us saying, hey, wait, 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 the, the Bible says. Well, you know, that's all passed away, but the Bible says God's no respecter of persons. The Bible says, that's always a good go-to. If you actually know what it says, you can use that one. That's why it's important that we know what it says. No condemnation, but the more you know, the more empowered you become. So here now we have the disciples plus Paul plus Stephen. So let's keep going. Philip was another one of those seven waiters. And if you'll remember, in Acts 1-8, the day Jesus went back to heaven on the hills of, of outside Jerusalem there after, you know, we're, we're 40 days after the resurrection in Acts chapter 1, and Jesus gives them some instruction, and then he was taken. He was talking to them, and the Bible says he was taken up into the clouds, you know, into heaven. And then two angels come up and said, why are you looking up into heaven? The same Jesus is going to come back to you in like manner, which means he's going to come back in the clouds. I think that day's coming rather quickly. Um, but he says to them in verse 8, before he did that, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, not within you, because when you get born again, you have the Spirit within you forever. Okay, and you're going to heaven. You're going to live in heaven forever. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, just for your own study, these people had the Holy Spirit, have had the Holy Spirit in them for 40 days because in Ju uh, John chapter 20, the night of the resurrection, Jesus appeared to them in the upper room and he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. This is 40 days after they were born again. And now there's 500 of them that are in Acts 1 hanging out with him, and then he commands them to, to go to the upper room, only 120 showed up. You might have thought that it was the beginning of deer season or something because there were 500 with him, and then only 120 showed up. That's okay. He wasn't mad. He loved them all, and he showed up for the 120 very powerfully. So we got some things to look forward to here today. But he says, when that happens to you, you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he's prophesying to them that when this happens to them, they're going to leave Jerusalem and they're going to go preach the gospel everywhere. Okay. So now let's go back to Acts 8.1. So now this is sometime after that. And it says, uh, by the way, Stephen was stoned to death at the end of chapter 7 for basically being, you know, a man of, of faith and power. And then it says, now Saul was consenting to Stephen's death, Acts 8.1. It goes on to say, and at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So if you overlay Acts 1.8 with Acts 8.1, they hadn't gone anywhere, but when the persecution came, they went everywhere. You see what I mean? And some people say, well, you know, God was punishing them, and to get them to do what he wanted, he sent persecution. No, he knew persecution's coming anyway. Persecution's coming anyway. 
God doesn't have to send the bad stuff. There's a devil for that. He sends the good stuff. And he tries to prepare us ahead of time. And whether we prepare and listen to him or not, he still loves us and still gracious to us. And so now they're like, oh, okay, this is what he was talking about. And they go to the very places in Acts 8.1 that Acts 1.8 tells them to go. Okay? Now, watch what happens when Philip, the waiter, gets down to Samaria. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, verse 4, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Let's just take a second. Verse 5, he went down to Samaria and preached Christ. And the multitude heeded the things spoken by him, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. It seems to me like you can't divide out the power from the message. You can't take away the power from the person. If you're going to preach Jesus, it's more than just preaching. It's more than just saying words. It's seeing those words turn into action. Faith produces an action. Amen? Now, just relax because nothing weird's going to happen today. You know, I know we think that when, when the power of God breaks out, it's got to be weird, but really it should just be normal. Verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And watch what happens. Verse 8, and they were all scared to death. It doesn't say that, does it? And there was great joy in the city. Why? Because unclean spirits were crying with a loud voice and came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. That causes great joy. But see, in the church in America, it doesn't. It's, uh, it makes people think, what? This is weird. This is uncomfortable. This is awkward. What's awkward is the church being so powerless 2,000 years post-resurrection. That's what's weird to me. So here's three things that we know for sure. Uh, the first, we'll say four things. The first one is you're going to beat the Baptist to the restaurant, so, so just relax. That's the one thing we know for sure. Number two, every believer has a mandate to walk in the miraculous. Every believer has a mandate to walk in the miraculous. Now, it doesn't mean that it's always spectacular on some kind of visible scale. But I'm telling you, if you pray for somebody and God touches them, that's miraculous whether there's a crowd of people around or, you know, somebody running through the aisles or not. So every believer has a mandate to walk in the miraculous. You say, well, we talked about the apostles. We said maybe throw Paul in there, and then we saw Stephen, and then we saw Philip. But how many more people than that? Well, I'm glad you asked. John 14, 12, most assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, he who believes in me, we all do, that's why we're here. The works that I do, he or she shall do also. And greater works than these he will do, she will do. Because I go to my Father. So anything that he did, there's nothing off the table. What's the need? You come across somebody that has a need. What's, what's too big for God? Can I pray for you? Do you mind if I just pray for you for a moment? And you pray for that person. You see, the result of that prayer is not your business. There's a lot of unbelief that causes people not to get answered prayer. Right? I'm not going to get ahead of myself because I'm going to preach that message here at some point. But unbelief, people have to deal with. Because we've had generations of teaching that this, this stuff has passed away. This is just something crazy people do that wear long dresses and put their hair up in 50 pounds of bobby pins. This is not for rational, educated folk. And that's all nonsense on every realm, right? It's just a bunch of perceived ideas and perceptions of people that really aren't even true. But the gospel has never changed. If we don't believe that, then what we're really saying is, and and, and again, we've talked about this before, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'll hit it maybe before we're done here. But the point being is this. If you believe everything Jesus did, you shall do too. You say, well, I don't know about that. Oh, you shall, one way or the other. You're, You're going to find yourself doing those very things. You know, how prepared can you be? 
How much gasoline can you store? How much butter beans can you hide in the cellar? How long can you last when they turn off the electricity? We're going to have to believe God. You know that, right? And if, in my opinion, for what it's worth, if God brought water from a rock and dropped Krispy Kremes from heaven for a bunch of stiff neck, unbelieving hardheads, what's he going to do for his kids? We need to build ourselves a bulwark of recognizing the miraculous and the opportunity for such things. What's too hard? Because he's going to the Father. Watch this now. In Acts 3, 4 through 10. This is Peter and John going to church. You know, some people say, well, I don't go to that church anymore because I, I can't get anything out of it. Okay, well, first of all, that's a lie no matter who you are, right? You can always get something. If somebody just stood up and read John 3, 16, you're getting something out of that if you're paying attention. But let's just say that they were like that because a lot of people are. Well, here's Peter and John going to the temple in Jerusalem they're not getting anything for them. What are they going to learn from whoever's in their teaching? No, they're going for the people who are there. So they see this, uh, they see this, um, this uh, guy begging at the gate of the temple and fixing his eyes on him with John, verse 4. Peter said, look at us. So he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He was expecting. Here's the first element of receiving your miracle. You need to be in some level of expectation that God is good and he's a performer of his word. Amen? So he gives them their attention. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. If you read the scripture carefully, you'll find he was married. So that's a valid, that's a valid thing there. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, the lame man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now watch this. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew it was he who was at the, uh, the begging at the gate, beautiful, of the temple, who were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And, uh, and so then, you know, he follows them in and all this stuff. And then they bring them before the council. They start quizzing them down because they're irritated that this happened. And when they ask Peter how that happened, he says this. It's, it's simpler than you think. Verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And if we jump to the last part of the next chapter, because he go, they go through a series of inquisitions there, and they throw him in jail, and then, you know, and then they teleport. If you read that passage, they throw them in jail overnight, an angel lets them out of jail. The next morning, the Bible says they're found preaching in the town square, and the, the people go back. And they look, and the guards are outside the, the cell, but nobody's inside. You thought just your fantasy movies with men wearing onesies running around pretending to be superheroes is the only place that kind of stuff happens. You see, we don't have an expectation of God moving in the miraculous because we've been dumbed down by Hollywood, and we say, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just in the movies. No, the movies are mimicking a reduced understanding of who God truly is. The Bible says in the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Guess what happens in those days? Oh, I know people are licentious and this and that, but there were giants in the land called Nephilim. There's going to be some crazy stuff in these days that you and I are here to navigate. And I've said it a thousand times, and everywhere I go, I, I, I still believe it, that, that when we get to heaven, we're going to want to know, what was it like in those days? What was it like? You know, we're going to go to Moses. What was it like coming across the Red Sea? And Moses is going to look at you and say, well, I'm actually Charlton Heston, but Moses is right over there. <laughs> but I'm truly convinced that what those people are going to want to know is what was it like being there then? What was it like having the Holy Spirit indwell you, live inside you? Oh, is that what that was? What was it like having the Spirit of God reside upon you, according to Acts 
and to walk in the miraculous and the supernatural nature of the gospel. What was that like? Because you would see the Holy Spirit come upon these prophets once in a while, but you and I have been clothed with that right now. But we've been mistaught and we don't have any belief because we have unbelief. The Bible says when we get to heaven, we're going to look at the devil and say, is this the one? Is this the one that destroyed kingdoms? Is this the one? And probably for a split second, we're going to think, man, I could have squashed that little sucker anytime I wanted. But I just kept playing patty cake with him. So now they get out of jail. They, they teleported downtown. They brought him back up. They go through this whole thing. They threaten them not to do it again. And then they go to their friends. These are the kind of friends we all need. And they went to this upper room. And it says, and, and, and they're praying now. This is their prayer life. This is after Acts 1-8 when Jesus said, wait for the power. This is after Acts, uh, Acts 1-2 where the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, the sound of a rushing mighty wind. So this is now two chapters after that. And they're praying, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They just raised a lame man who had been lame from birth. And they're praying for boldness. I, I, when I was a kid at uh, high school, I had a buddy that had an RX-7, and it was that old rotary engine that was just bulletproof. And we would read all these magazines about that engine. And in some of the testing they would do is they would drive that thing to red line on these tracks and then downshift and still not blow the engine up. That's how I see this prayer. They are like redlining, yanking people into the reality of who Jesus is, and they get in their prayer time, and they're asking God for boldness. Wow. They're asking him for more. And when they had prayed, verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. We get distracted by the tongues issue, because that's what happens in Acts, in Acts 2. But another characteristic of a spirit-filled believer is boldness and the aspect of that boldness is you know a majority of the time we're saying something it's not our opinion it's the word says the word says the word says the word says you know the tricky thing about saying the word says you got to know what it says you got to know what it says number two the miraculous is not a leader, it's a follower. We believe it. There's not one of us that don't. And we're waiting for it to happen so we can follow it. Yeah! But it, it's not a leader. It follows you. I can prove it. Now watch this. This is Acts 5, 14 through 16. And believers were increasingly, increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Peter is just a guy, a knucklehead at that, denied the Lord three times, and he's just going for Starbucks, and as his shadow falls on people, people are getting healed. What if we just expected that wherever we go, we're going to diffuse the presence of God? You are the diffusers of heaven. Well, I don't believe that. Well, then it will never, ever happen in your presence because this is all by faith. But if you believe that it's your mandate to carry the essence of his glory everywhere you go. I told this story. I was preaching in Kansas last week. And when we were in Bible college, 
uh, I had to leave work and go get my dri Oklahoma driver's license. And, you know, it was costing me money because I couldn't afford not to be at work. And so I had to go out to this. It wasn't like most places where, like, it's in a city. It was out in the middle of nowhere in this little shack. And I go in, and the lady's like, oh, yeah, hey, you know, can I help you? I said, well, I'm here to get a Oklahoma driver's license. She goes, my computer just went down. And I'm on my lunch break, and I'm like, uh. She goes, well, it might come back in a, in, you know, in a little bit. You can have a seat. So I said, okay, thanks. And she turned around and went to this back room. And this was back in the days where the, the computer monitors were about this deep. Some of you remember those, those days. They weren't like skinny, you know. They were, they were, they were sizable. And I just reached over the counter and touched the back of that computer, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you're going to work <laughs> now. <laughs> and I went back and sat down, and a few minutes later, the lady comes out and says, oh, wow, my computer's back up. And, you know, you could say, well, you know, that just happened. Maybe, maybe, but I wasn't going to just sit there and wait for maybe. I wanted to get actively involved because I was expecting what I was carrying. See, even Peter, he expected that he had something he could give. He said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have. What do you think you have today? Do you have anything? Because you have more than maybe you think. And if you start living life like I think there's something on me that has a tangibility of heaven, and when I touch somebody, that's going to be transferred. Are you the healer? No. You're simply the dispenser. You're like a water fountain. Nobody ever stepped back from an ice cold drink of water in a water fountain and give me, man, that water fountain is wonderful. I wonder what brand that is. They don't even have them anymore. But back in the day when we drank out of water fountains, you're like, that water is awesome. It wasn't the, the dispenser that mattered so much. You're just the dispenser. Listen to this, Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. Remember I told you that the miraculous is a follower, not a leader. We'd all get in behind it if it, if it were, but it's not. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, Jesus is speaking. That's why it's in red. I think it's in red. Yeah, it is. It is here. I wasn't sure if it was up there. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. Now, this doesn't mean you're some weirdo out in the country dancing around with snakes, okay? If you read Acts 28, where Paul gets bit by a poisonous viper, the guy had just swam to shore through a hurricane, gets to shore, gathers up some sticks to build a fire because there's a hurricane, and a snake jumps out and bites him. Now, most of us would have said, you know, I knew it. This always happens to me. I can never catch a break. And then we just curled up and died. Paul shook it off into the fire. And just kept warming himself. He didn't even say anything. And people were watching him, waiting for him to die. And when he didn't die, an entire revival of healing and salvation swept the island of Malta. And everybody on the island got saved. Because this man felt like he was carrying something that wasn't going to let himself die because he got bit by a snake. And nothing, even if you drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt you. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is Jesus speaking. Let me give you one more. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24. This is, this is my first landing here. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24. So Jesus answered them and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, And does not doubt in his heart, But believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say. So now he just established a spiritual law. This is like the law of gravity, okay? He says, if you believe that those things that you say, you'll have whatever you say. That's the law. Then he says, therefore I say. So he just established for all eternity, what you say matters. And it's predicated on what you believe. So what you believe matters. And you're going to say what you believe. And when you do, you will have whatsoever you say. Because you're not just saying it. You're saying it because you believe it. And there's substance to your faith. 
So he says, therefore, I'm going to step out on this spiritual law. Therefore, I say to you. So that means he just established he's going to get whatever he says, right? Because he said you can too. Therefore, I say to you, what things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them when? When you pray, and you will have them. Well, what if it doesn't look like it? So? What if it doesn't feel like it? You're not walking by feeling. You're walking by faith. Well, how do I keep, how do I keep, you know, how do I stay in the zone? You keep declaring what you've already received. I know. I know. I got cows that look at a new gate just the same way. Don't know what to do with it. Does that make any sense at all? Jesus said it. Hmm. So it matters what we say. Therefore, it matters what we believe. Because what we say will reflect what we believe. And look, I was, I was raised in the South. So I know how it can be with us, you know. I know how we, we talk death just as a second language, you know. Well, this always happens to us. Our, our folks have never gotten ahead. We can't ever, you know, this happened. Everybody's died of this, and we'll probably die too, and that's always happened, and nobody's ever had, you know, made any money. or, You know, it's just it's something to say because there's, there's quiet in the room. We need to change that. We need to start speaking life. We need to speak, start speaking eternity. Miracle signs and wonders are manifestations of the new covenant, not, not, not even the old covenant, really. They, they happened in the old, but it's more of a, uh, a component of the new. I've already quoted 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 for you, so you just, you just make note of that and go back and read it later. Let's look at Luke 19, uh, chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he's given us the authority over the devil. And I know we, you know, we watch movies about the devil being so strong and this and that, and it's just not the case. There's people that, that placate to that, and, and I believe that there'd be a lot less celebrities that also were worshipped in our culture, but there'd be a lot less of them worshipping the devil on national television if the church was doing its job. We've acquiesced. We don't believe in any power. We don't believe in any supernatural. Well, guess who does? The devil. And guess who's drawn to that? People. Albeit stupid people, but they are. And the devil is just a fake of what God has already prepared for us. No power at all. There's a story of a man named Smith Wigglesworth who preached the gospel in the area of Wales back in the last century. And he, he, in his ministry, there are several people that were raised from the dead. And his wife had passed, and he was in his home alone, and he heard her rocking chair creaking downstairs in the middle of the night. So he goes downstairs, you know, lights a lantern or whatever, goes in there, and it's what he understood, you know, because he sees this figure there as the devil. And he says, oh, it's just you. Blows out the lamp and goes back to bed. No fear. What are we afraid of? The only reason we're afraid of anything is we don't know who we are in Christ. You are in Christ. You're not in you anymore. Now, whether you walk out that reality or not is up to you. You get to decide. But it's high time that we start knowing what the Bible says about us, owning that, and walking that out in the earth. Because there's people dying because they don't know the truth. And they think God's the, 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 you know, the progenitor of all their problems. He's not. You know, based on that verse we just read in Mark 16, speak to the mountain. People will fight you over that, and they'll say, well, that part of Mark isn't in some translations. Do you know that it's in more translations than it's not? Look it up. And guess what? It coincides and it, and it complements everything else written and said by Jesus. So speak to the mountain. 
You know, I've been in hospital rooms and, and, and just asked, well, what's, you know, what's going on? Well, we've, we prayed. Okay, good. What else? Well, we've, you know, we've read the word and, okay, cool. We, we, we sang a little worship. Okay, good. Has anybody talked to it? We'll, we'll talk to what? We'll talk to the cancer. Talk to the issue. Jesus said, speak to the mountain and it shall be removed. Oh, well, that's so uncomfortable. Well, there's been times when I've asked unbelieving family members to just wait in the hall. Jesus did it. Peter did it. Could y'all just give us a few minutes? See, the devil wants to kill us. And if this sounds weird to you, I just, I just encourage you, read your Bible. The only thing weird is that nobody in church knows this stuff. We don't negotiate with the devil. We, we make a directive over him that he must keep. And all we have to do is believe. And even when we can't believe, we say, Lord, help my unbelief. And, th- and I understand that we're coming from, you know, from a deficit because we haven't been taught very well in church. But, friend, these are the days. And, um, and not everything is, 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 you know, we don't lose. I believe that even when things are getting worse, and I think things temporarily going to get better, they should. But there's a lot of ways where things will get worse. But what we need to recognize is we're here to make a difference. And you don't even have to, you don't have to be weird. This isn't weird unless you make it weird. It's not uncomfortable unless you make it uncomfortable. There's a, there's a tangibility to God's presence. It's a story of a man who was in a town a long time ago leading a revival and he stayed with a couple and for four or five days and then he was leaving and the lady runs after him and says, you can't leave yet. My husband's not saved yet. The old guy says, just don't change the sheets. He was staying in their room. Just don't change the sheets. So she didn't and about, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., whatever, her husband said, there's something wrong with me. There's something happening to me. I don't know what it is. And he was coming undone. She relayed the story that this man had told her. He got on his knees and gave his life to Jesus. You have to believe that you have something to give, just the way Peter did at the gate. I don't have money to give you, but what I do have, I will give you. It's just a recognition of who you are in Christ. It's just a recognition that you carry everything God has to offer. It's yours. And it doesn't have to be weird. Sometimes people don't even know it. You just walk by somebody and you, you probably should know them if you're going to touch the shoulder of a, somebody's wife. But you know what I mean? <laughs> when I shake hands with people, I'll touch their, their elbow. Because I believe something's going to happen good. Because there's a transfer always. Well, Father, we come before you today. We're so grateful to be alive at this point in time in history. We thank you for the word and what the word promises and what the word says. And thank you, Lord, that the kingdom has come. And Lord, as we walk this out, as, we, as we're learning what the Bible says, as we're discovering that there's more to what maybe we ever knew, that you're so gracious with us, that you take time with us. Holy Spirit, you share the truth of this word with us, that you reveal it to us, Lord, that you cause us to, to just walk it out within our own context, in our own personality. We don't have to be strange or goofy or weird with it, but we're just a light in the dark. We give you the praise today. If you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, all you have to do right where you sit is just believe that he is who he says he is, that he's the son of God, that he died for your sins, and that his blood was enough, that he took your place, that he paid a price you couldn't pay. If you believe that, then you're born again by definition. You don't have to do anything. 
You say, well, I have to believe. That's doing something. Well, faith is a rest, not a work. So technically, you're not doing anything. You're resting in Him. It's as simple as that. If you say, Lord, this is, this is a time in my life where I know you're calling me to rise up to who I truly am in you, then, then step into that. You'll never regret it. These are the days that he's called you to. These are your days. Isaiah had his days. Paul had his days. Philip and Stephen, they had their days. These are ours. Let's not wish them away, but let's live them to the full every single day. Father, we give you the praise today in Jesus' name. Amen.